Hello and welcome back to Learn Linux TV. In today's video, we're going to talk about dashboards. Now hold on, hold on, don't run away. I promise this one is actually good. In particular, we're going to take a look at Cockpit. Cockpit is an awesome web dashboard you could use to not only get a visual on the resource usage of your Linux server, you can also interact with your Linux server as well, which makes it especially cool. Now I get it, some dashboards are clunky, hard to configure, and some can even argue that some of these dashboards are, well, a waste of resources. But Cockpit is none of those things. It's actually quite useful. Once installed, Cockpit provides you with a really cool dashboard that gives you all kinds of neat capabilities. So it's definitely something that you might want to consider installing if this fits your use case. Now, I fully understand that some administrators out there, they're so seasoned that something like this might not have a lot of use for them but if you think about the junior administrators on your team, if you have a team or work in a team, or your managers or things like that, you can actually give access to graphs, dashboards, and even make it a little bit easier for a junior administrator to get started with system administration. In this video, what I'm going to do is show you how to install Cockpit, and then we'll log in and check it out. And Cockpit is especially awesome on your Linode server, because if you are running Linux in the cloud, you definitely want to keep an eye on resources there as well, because you definitely don't want your company's website, your personal blog, your Minecraft server, or whatever you happen to be using Linode for to go down. That would not be a great day. Now, if you don't already have your very own cloud Linux server, you should definitely check out Linode. They're giving away $100 in free credit that new customers can use to start their account. And this credit is good for up to 60 days. Considering they have instance types that cost as little as $5 a month, you could do a lot of Linuxing with that credit. Their platform is quite fast too. It typically takes less than two minutes to spin up an instance, and the responsiveness of their platform is really good. In fact, it's even gotten better as NVMe-based block storage is rolling out to customers right now, and you'll have access to that as well when you start your account. A Linux server available in the cloud with really fast storage? I mean, what could be better than that? So definitely check out Linode if you haven't already done so, and get yourself a server. Even if you don't intend on hosting your own blog, Minecraft server, Nextcloud instance, or anything like that, you can still benefit by using their platform to spin up Linux instances that you can use while learning Linux from the countless tutorials that are available on Learn Linux TV. And Linode has been a sponsor of Learn Linux TV for quite a while now. I actually lost count of how many years they've been a sponsor. I really appreciate them sponsoring this content. It means a lot to me, and I definitely recommend that you check them out if you don't already have an account, because by checking them out, you'll not only have access to really awesome cloud Linux servers, you'll also be supporting Learn Linux TV as well, and I really appreciate that. Anyway, with all that out of the way, let's dive into Cockpit. What I'm going to do is bring up the console, I'll log in, and I'll show you around the interface. And then after that, I'll go ahead and show you how to install it on your Linux server. So first of all, what I'm going to do is paste in the IP address for my Linux server. And here's mine right here. If you have a domain name for your Linux server, you can include that in place of your IP, but I just have an IP address for this instance, so that's good enough for me. And then we type colon, and then the port number of 9090. Now in my case, I don't have a TLS certificate installed on this server, so this message in particular is actually normal. So what I'm going to do is click on Advanced, and then I'll accept the risk, even though there isn't a risk. I'm well aware of why this is the case. I'll click on that button. And now we have the login screen. Now your login screen might look different than mine, especially if you are using a different distribution. As you can see, I have Ubuntu branding on mine, but different distributions will package this differently and include a different logo there. You might have a different background, but it's essentially the same thing. What we're going to do right now is, well, log in. But what's the username? What's the password? It doesn't show any output when you install it that it set up an account for you, so how do you actually access this? Well, it's simple actually. In order to log into Cockpit, all you have to do is type in whatever your username is on the Linux server itself and that same password, because Cockpit actually uses Linux system accounts. So I'll type in mine right here. 
And we're going to leave this box checked. We definitely want to have access to privileged tasks. That's one of the many benefits of Cockpit. And then I'll click log in. And here we are. I'm logged into Cockpit on my Linux server and we're ready to go. So let's go ahead and check out a few things in the interface here. That way we can see some of the things that Cockpit allows us to do. And one of which is going to be the dashboard, this button right here. And what this does is it shows us, well, a dashboard. So I guess if you want to show your manager a dashboard or system usage or something like that, you can simply take a screenshot of this right here. Now in my case, there's virtually nothing going on. And the reason for that is because the server that I've installed Cockpit onto is doing, well, nothing at all. It's just a Cockpit example. That's all it's doing. There's no actual tasks in the background. So you could think of this server as a relatively unused server. Anyway, you could click on different tabs here. So memory usage, network usage, and one of my favorites right here, disk IO. This is especially useful if you are running into slowness on your Linux server. If you want to find out why is it running so darn slow, a lot of times that could be disk IO. And we have a tab for that. So if this was going absolutely crazy right here, then that would actually be something I'd want to pay attention to. So what I could do is actually just, well, generate some usage. I'm going to run sudo apt clean, and then sudo apt update. And we should see the usage right here on this chart actually go up. And right here, we are actually seeing a spike. So the apt update did cause a spike in usage. That makes sense. It's downloading something. And although it's a relatively small amount of data, we can see that the graph is directly impacted by whatever we're doing on the server. Back here in the host section, and this is the first section that you see when you log in, we have some general information right here. We also have a CPU and memory graph right here as well, although it doesn't look quite as fancy as the other screen. But what this screen right here does is it gives you a summary of your usage. It also gives you some health information as well, such as available updates like you see here. I have some system information. I have my machine ID right here as well. And as you can see in the overview section, we have some general information right here. If I click on logs, I really like this. We can see all kinds of things that are going on with our server in the logging section. Now, I've just created the server today. In fact, it was probably about 30 minutes before record time. So there really isn't anything going on here, nothing to log just yet. But this is interesting right here. It looks like somebody was trying to get into the server via key authentication. That's interesting. So I'll click on that. It says the connection was closed. And this is probably internet background noise. I mean, when you have a cloud server available on the public internet, of course, people are going to try to get into it. So you'll see things like this. It's normal. As long as you are doing your due diligence to secure your server, you should be fine. But it's really cool that we can get access to logging information here. And we also have storage. And as you can see, I'm barely using any storage at all. But this is cool. If you want to simply check the disk usage on your server, that's a good way to do it. And there's all kinds of different things that we could do here in Cockpit. But before we go any further, what I want to do right now is show you how to install it. And after we do that, we'll return to Cockpit and I'll show you some of the remaining sections. So let's talk about how to install it. Right now, I'm on the official website for the Cockpit project. And if you scroll down, right about here, you'll see some of the distributions that are supported. Now, this isn't an exhaustive list because, well, any distribution can package Cockpit. And there's other distributions that package it than what you see right here. But not only that, a lot of these distributions that you see here have other versions, variations, spins, forks, things like that. And by association, those distributions will have access to Cockpit as well. So for example, with Ubuntu, that means you should be able to install this on Linux Mint, Ubuntu Mate, Kubuntu, or whatever flavor of Ubuntu you happen to be using. And we also see CentOS as an option as well. And since CentOS is supported, that also means that distributions such as Alma Linux, Rocky Linux, Oracle Linux, and others will also have access to Cockpit. Now here on my terminal, I'm already connected to a Linux instance, so I'll go ahead and show you the process of installing Cockpit. On my end, this particular server is running Ubuntu server, but the commands that I'm about to give you will work for Debian as well. And on the official page for this project, they have instructions for other distributions. So if you're using something else, 
You could go ahead and just change the package manager to whatever your package manager happens to be. If you have any trouble, then you could check out the instructions for your distribution on their page. First of all, what I'm going to do is update my package repository index. And in the case of Debian and Ubuntu, that is simply sudo apt and then update. And this should go by pretty quickly. And now that that's done, I'll clear the screen. And then next we can run sudo apt install and then cockpit. And what that'll do is get it installed. It's literally that easy. So I'll press enter. And I'll press enter to confirm because there's a lot of dependencies there that need to be installed along with cockpit itself. And now it's installing. And that's it. With those two commands, we now have cockpit installed on our server and it's ready to go. All right, so here we are back in cockpit. And earlier in the video, I was showing you around. We took a quick segue so I could show you how to install it. And now that we're back on this page, let's continue to look around at the interface. So we left off here with storage. Let's go to networking. And this is really cool because you can see the network traffic right here in these graphs for your server. So you could actually see how busy the networking is. That's pretty cool. You could add a VLAN, a bond, a bridge, and you also get some information about your networking here as well. So as you can see, this is pretty useful. In addition to that, we have an account section. And this is really cool. So what you could do is create a Linux user on the underlying Linux server right here from Cockpit. And the process of doing so is simple. You click on this button right here, and then you fill out the fields. It's that easy. I'm not actually going to create an account on my end because I already have one for myself, but you get the idea. If you want to create an account for another user, you could do that right here from within Cockpit. And not only that, I can also get some information about the user accounts that already exist on the server. So here's my user account, for example, and you can see that I'm an administrator. And it not only gives me a checkbox next to server administrator, it also shows me which Unix group is associated with sudo on the system. So that way, if I want to interrogate the group on the underlying system, I can do that. I can lock the account if for some reason I need to do that. Of course, I'm not going to do that. You can force a password change. So that's really useful when it comes to compliance and things like that. And I could even add an SSH key for my user here as well. Now, we also have a section for services, and I really like this. Now, as you can see, there's all kinds of system services here that are running on my server. But I really like how this information is actually shown. So if I click on any one of these, I'm just going to randomly choose, I don't know, let's choose this one. When you access this, you get some really useful information about the service that you don't always find in tools like this. So for example, the underlying system uses systemd. So what we have here is a systemd unit or service for accounts daemon. But it also shows us what it actually depends on, conflicts with, and the order of start. Because right here it shows that we want it to start up before shutdown, before the graphical target is launched, and we want it to be after these services right here. So if you're curious at all what a service depends on, I mean, yeah, you could find that information out from the command line, and there's nothing here that you can't get from the command line. This is just an abstraction. But I think it's really useful to get access to this information. So you know if you don't have a terminal in front of you, you at least have a web browser, and you could use this to actually manage your server from a remote location. Speaking of terminal, we have a terminal. And this is really cool because I could run commands right from cockpit. Whatever command I'd like, I have a terminal right here ready to go, and it automatically logged me in as the user that I logged into Cockpit with, and that makes the process very seamless. Now, as an aside, because of the fact that you get access to a terminal, and also because you can use Cockpit to manage your server, it's a really good idea to put this behind a firewall. As soon as you have something publicly available, including Cockpit, people will try to log into it, or actually brute force it. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Cockpit by default runs on port 9090. So one way you can actually fix this problem is by using a firewall to create a whitelist rule and have that set up to allow access to port 9090 based on the IP address that's trying to access that port. So for example, if your company has a static IP or maybe you have one at home or something like that, you can limit access to that IP, which is going to enhance security. But anyway, as you've just seen, Cockpit is very easy to install. I gave you a quick overview, and you could judge for yourself whether or not this will have value on your server. 
But it's something that I recommend that you check out, even if it's not useful to you. Maybe you feel like your command line skills are so amazing that you don't need something like this, and that's totally fine. I get it. But if anyone asks you for a dashboard or some easy to use method of getting started with managing a Linux server, then Cockpit is something that you might want to consider pointing them to. So as you can see, Cockpit is very easy to install and, well, it's useful as well. Not everyone is going to have a use case for a dashboard, but if you do have a use case for a dashboard, Cockpit is available in the distributions repositories by default, so that way you can install it very quickly and easily and get access to a really cool dashboard in your web browser. Anyway, thank you guys so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Make sure you click that like button if you like this video because that lets YouTube know that you want to see more content just like this. Also, make sure you subscribe to Learn Linux TV if you haven't already done so. I have some really cool videos coming very soon, if I do say so myself, that I can't wait to show you guys, so stay tuned for that. Anyway, thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.